Director's of the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake City. Today, August 15th, um, meeting. Uh, our meetings are public, and we are welcome. To, you are welcome to join us in person on Zoom or by watching Salt Lake City Council agenda page, Facebook, YouTube, and SLC TV. We hope you will join us whichever manner you feel most comfortable. Uh, there is not, uh, going, moving on on the agenda, there is no public comment today since this, this is not a standard meeting. There is no general comment or public hearings today. Please join the board on September 12th to make comments if you so wish. Uh, there is no public hearing as I mentioned. And uh, moving on to item C, the redevelopment agency business. We are now on redevelopment agency business and I will turn the time over to staff and the administration to lead us through the options and guide us uh, with what feedback they need from us at this point. I understand that we might wait to take formal action until September, but let's talk through options. Danny or Tammy, uh, who's best to lead on this portion? I know Danny Waltz uh, is online right now. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am happy to initiate the discussion and, and start that. And then obviously, if there are any questions that uh, blend over to uh, what's appropriate to speak to on the city side, we can certainly ask others to participate. Um, I will also indicate, Mr. Chair, and for the members of the board that the city attorney's uh, representatives are available as well, if there are questions for them. So um, I will start with uh, indicating, uh, number one, Mr. Chair, that we apologize we have not provided a formal term sheet uh, for consideration uh, in time for this meeting, but we have emailed uh, to council staff, and I believe the rest of you have that available to you as well, for the options uh, that we have compiled to date for additional con conditions that the board may consider as part of this loan. Um, if those are in front of you and the other members of the board, I'm happy to go through them. Or if you prefer, we can just jump to answering questions uh, and be available. Our intention is to get direction from the board today so that we may finalize the terms of the loan, uh, whatever closing conditions are appropriate, and then what other consideration for ongoing requirements that we may need to pull into it. Um, with that direction from the board, uh, I would assume we would be returning with a uh, updated and revised resolution that incorporate those. Um, I should mention that the attorney's office has prepared resolutions uh, today for both the bill uh, item and the tax credit consideration. If the board chooses or has a direction as of today that they wish to proceed on, or as you indicated, uh, we can formalize that and return at a later RDA meeting. Um, I think as you've been advised and updated to date, uh, the city's loan uh, is already at the point where they're uh, carrying through their conditions for closing, whereas the RDA loan, given the action from the board last week, we would still need to return to you either today for approval of that resolution or at a later meeting for us to proceed. So that's the status of where we're at. Uh, as I indicated, we're, we're looking to get any direction from the board today that we can utilize to finalize that for approval. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, to indicate whether you'd like to go through those conditions or if we want to just jump to questions from the members of the board. Board members, how, how do we want to do this? Mr. Chair, I think going through the conditions would be good. Okay. Can you hear me? No, not that strong, but yes, uh, so conditions. We can start with the conditions, Danny. Okay, great. Um, let me start from, uh, if, if you're referring to the list that we provided uh, for the benefit of the public and the audience, l let me start at the bottom of that list, which I think it's important to go over. What are the conditions that are already included either in our standard loan agreements or conditions for closing? And I think that can help uh, understand what are some of the things that the board has been talking about or concerns that they have that are already part of it. And then I'll stop at that point for questions and then we can jump into the, the other conditions. So uh, first and foremost, the, any borrower that the agency does a loan for obviously is required to get all required building permits, occupancy permits, any other licenses, approvals that are required from what we just classify as government authority uh, in relation to the construction and completion of the project. So this is everything from uh, the construction side and ultimate occupancy of the project. Um, and then they have to provide us copies or we have the ability to verify that information uh, once it's issued as a condition for us either closing or as part of our ongoing uh, release of the construction funds and or then at the uh, final disbursement, just verifying that all of our conditions have been met. 
So, so that's a big one. I think that captures a lot of what are some of the concerns right now is related to the building permits and the construction of the project. A um, little bit broader than that, we also require as part of our loan documents that the borrower must be in compliance with all material, federal, state, and local laws, statutes, ordinances, a uh, bit of a catch-all here just to make sure that they're doing everything they need to do as far as meeting rules and regulations from government authority, environmental laws, and requirements that uh, are related to the real property uh, as well as hazardous materials. So this pulls in anything from the county and the county health department and safety ordinances as well as the city code. So. That's a lot. As I said, it's a bit of a broad definition that gives us the ability to make sure that the project is meeting any requirements that would be uh, related to the project construction and or the ongoing occupancy. So I'll pause there for a second if there's any questions on that, either for myself or the attorneys to, to provide a little bit better definition of that. I have a question, Mr. Chair. It, um, Danny, it seems like those make sense. Is this are the, is that language we include in all of our loans, regardless of what it's for i i mean they seem like pretty low um yes. standards so okay yep. so every every loan we approve in the last recent memory should have this language in it that is correct that's just our standard language as part of our loan closings and agreements any other questions okay okay um Okay, so from there, here are some other possible funding conditions that the board may consider. I, I should mention that at this point, as far as the administration attorneys, we have not necessarily put in any of these as far as what we would strongly recommend or suggest or, or have incorporated that in a proposed term sheet at this time. So I think it's for the sake of discussion and trying to identify what uh, are some of the concerns and the comments from the board uh, and how we could address those. So. Um, We'll, we'll be happy to discuss and answer any questions of that as we go through. So first of all, uh, additional condition, obviously, uh, given the status of the project and some of its recent uh, issues, uh, ensuring that the util all utilities are paid in full upon closing and, and not just enough to bring them up to where the utilities are turned on, but that there is uh, no opportunity there for that any of the utilities are you know about to be turned off or that they have any significant past due balances on them. Um, on top of that is the requirement that they would need to maintain uh, current status of all utilities during construction, um, not just for the benefit of the project, but obviously, as we know, for the benefit of the tenants who are part of the project as well. Um, we, we did talk about the building permit, but as I said, that's usually standard uh, within our loan agreements already. Um, one thing that we, we generally have a right to do uh, already, just as far as our own closing and making sure projects move forward, is for the developer to provide evidence of all of their funding sources. So I said, this is usually something that uh, is taken care of by the title companies as, as we close, along with whatever other funding they have and equity. We make sure we verify that. Um, but it, if it, you know, something that the board would like to do, we can obviously strengthen the language related to that and verify that those sources are in place uh, and the funding is available and has been dispersed. As it relates to the RDA loan, we will most likely be closing uh, significantly after what would be their primary financing uh, and their takeout loan and paying that off as well as the city funds coming into the project. So most of that will be verified uh, already on the city process. But then as an agency, as we come in, we would just uh, probably have the ability to verify that even further to see where the project is at at that point. Um, jump in at any time, Mr. Chair, or members of the board, if there's any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll go through this and then we can circle back on anything. Um, one thing that uh, the city does have on their side with the loan is a unit delivery schedule. We do not have that right now as part of the RDA loan. Uh, that just has not been uh, something we required as much as we're already looking at the city agreements as establishing that and meeting those deadlines um, because our loan was kind of coming in later in the process. So uh, we could certainly provide that as a function of the RDA loan as well, uh, along with an updated construction schedule um, and asking the developer to kind of formalize more of what those dates are and, uh, that he anticipates hitting for the construction. Um, Mr. Chair, in go ahead. Oh, sorry. Before we move on from the, the schedule, I yes. think that's something that Council Member Valdemoros, sorry, Board Member Valdemoros was interested in is what the schedule for unit delivery, and I hopefully she can clarify the question when she's here, but what the schedule for unit delivery will be and what the recourse is if that schedule is not met. Like if 
we say we're going to get units open in four months and it gets to month six and they're still not open can we claw back the loan or can we take can we take over the project like what what is the um what is the recourse if that schedule is not met great great question um one to your point yes if director von morris uh when she's available can provide any additional concerns she has understandable um our understanding on the city side is that the schedule the unit delivery schedule um either needs to be updated or has not been met. And so we can certainly work with the developer on updating that. And then the third piece that you mentioned as far as recourse, uh, if I may, I'll cover that a little bit in the last bullet point. And then Director Mono, if we can, uh, we can obviously get in more detail uh, with that as it relates to not just this item, but other items, if that's appropriate. Thanks, Danny. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, in addition to the unit schedule, uh, we we have also already had conversations with the developer. We don't necessarily have this as a function of our loan right now, but we could ask the developer to submit a, a description and, and a plan for the ongoing maintenance and management of the property. Uh, this could include everything of how, you know, they're just going to maintain the units beyond closing, what their management plan is for, for both units and, and trash and, and their RV parking and all of the things that you would like. Um, we could ask for further clarification on that um, and, and rec the developer acknowledging that he's going to continue to meet everything from county health and city code compliance and, and, and how they're going to necessarily establish those relationships with the tenants and services. I will note as staff, this is a little bit of uh, an area that we don't necessarily get into very often. Um, I think if you heard us say, this uh, affordable housing project has a little bit of a different wrinkle in it as this is a uh, for-profit developer versus this is not a loan that we're providing to a nonprofit affordable housing developer that is doing a tax credit deal where we can rely on a lot of those other requirements and regulations to cover this aspect of the ongoing management maintenance of the project. Um, but I think there are certainly aspects here that we could ask of this developer to identify and lay out just so we have an understanding of what the expectations are moving forward. Um, so that is something that the board may wish to consider. Uh, along with that is asking the developer to identify what their ongoing uh, cash flow is going to be and specifically what the ability is to set aside a maintenance reserve account. Again, as I said, tax credit deals, this is a required part of the pro forma and ongoing cash flow for the project. So we rely on that and those requirements that they have to kind of update those units. We can ask this developer to just identify how they anticipate and plan on doing that as part of their long-term ownership and management. So. Those are the conditions that we, we've put out there. Uh, happy to get into some of the details of those because some of those are tricky. And then Director Mono, to your point, as far as recourse, I should mention that right now, uh, the way the RDA loan is proposed to be was a three-year bridge loan to essentially get to the construction and rehab of the units and then get this project to a point of stabilization where the developer along with his primary financing and the RDA loan would then refinance that and pay us off. So that's important to think about because from an RDA standpoint, that technically really puts us in this deal for a period of three years where we can have these conditions and requirements. Um, if we're looking at trying to do something that extends beyond what our financial involvement would be in the project, then we would need to get into with the attorneys what that could look like of what's appropriate for us then to put potentially into a land use restriction and how we can kind of have those provisions extend beyond just our limited time in this project. And then specifically, what is the related recourse opportunities tied to those different mechanisms that we would have to use to enforce these conditions? And then what are the penalties if they're not met? And by that, I mean, if the RDA is paid off in year three, we still have ongoing conditions and requirements that say are violated in year five or six, what do we have then at that point as far as recourse versus if we were to have a loan for a period of 30 years, we could look at things like, you know, interest rate, default rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we will have those abilities uh, during the construction and we could tie that to the protections there. So if for whatever reason he violates, you know, the utility clause, then we, we could potentially have a provision that increases the rate of interest. 
that he then has to pay ultimately as part of repaying the RDA loan. But those get a little bit trickier once you get into a period of time where we don't have that direct recourse and we have to do something else where we may have to pursue legal action uh, if there's any violations. So that's a lot to put on the table. I'll stop right there and we can address any questions or discussion, Mr. Chair. Remember doing. Yeah, thank you, Danny, for all that. And you were kind of mentioning going back and forth for a, from a, a for-profit a loan discussion to a nonprofit and the and the tax write offs, and basically where the, your concerns and your 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 recommendations and your points are ba- uh, the same same uh, points and concerns that we would have on a, on a that would be addressed in a uh, nonprofit organization's loan on a profit side. So we're not we're not adding anything more than what is always uh, required on a nonprofit loan. Am I- yes, that, that is correct, Director Dugan. That's a great point to make that we are not, at least for a lot of these, we are not asking for anything else that we don't already have as part of other loans and agreements as much as we generally can lean on some of those other financiers or funding sources to help us uh, provide these requirements. And then we can piggyback on those versus in this situation, we may need to be adding those ourselves because we don't have that ability. Okay, it's a great clarification. Thank you. Board member uh, Manu. That's really helpful, Danny. And um, I, because I didn't realize that it didn't dawn on me that piece of because I know with the LITAC process, there's all sorts of other not hoops, but requirements that the development needs to agree upon. And it's like a 15 year period that they're actually being monitored. So that's helpful. And I think it gives us a really good reason to add some of these monitoring things into our loan, at least for the term of the loan. My question is what happens if the loan, so if the, if the loan is unable to be repaid back, adding interest, like increasing the interest rate just makes it harder for the loan to ever be paid back. So like, it seems like a compounding problem. So (laughs) how, like at some point it's never, like you said that at that point we need to think about legal action is that placing a lien on the property and how do you place a lien on a property that is where the ground is leased and can you just lien the improvements I, I don't know understand how all that works and like worst 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 case scenario does this what happens what are our options in that in that point um, no, that's I'll, a great question oh go ahead I sorry I, go ahead thank you okay uh, I'll, I'll answer that first, and then sorry if I cut you off, Director Mono. If there's a follow-up, please jump in, um, and and I'll lean on the attorneys if we want to get into really details on on how that recourse looks um, specifically. But to your first point, as far as a default rate, um, that's not unsimilar than if you have a mortgage or a car loan, to where obviously if you violate any provision of your loan for that period of time that you're in violation, you have a default rate and and you have to pay a penalty. Um, to your point, yes, sometimes if, if what you uh, are in violation for is a cash flow issue, then yes, you're kind of adding on top of that uh, of what you're imposing. But at the same time, during that period of time, you have an ability to, ha- you have a lien on the property, you have an ability to then, you know, stay on title on that property. And the only way to clear that at some point is to pay that off free and clear. And so while you may technically be compounding the problem, you may not necessarily get that money for a while until they actually are able to pay you off and clear that. So uh, sometimes it serves as more of a motivation not to go into a penalty. Uh, as much as you're not necessarily requiring something in that moment, as much as just motivating the borrower to make sure that they don't stay in violation of that. Um, And as you said, that works great if we're in that period of time with the loan where we have that ability. Um, And if we suddenly are out of that period of time where we no longer are expecting a repayment, then yes, we bump into the part of the loan where our recourse is to probably uh, pursue legal action against the property um, and that can be everything from, uh, you know, payment of damages to legal recourse, or um, this is where the attorneys can jump in and indicate what that, you know, strength that really is at that point. But it would be proceeding, moving forward with legal action against the developer to enforce the provisions of this agreement, just like you would pursue legal action to provide uh, recourse over any contract and, and agreement that you have uh, in a real estate setting. I guess the question is relevant because as we 
as our need for deeply affordable housing increases and our level of risk that as a city we're willing to accept um, continues to increase for all projects that we're involved in that are deeply affordable or permanent supportive, then that risk for um, the project just not turning out, units never actually hitting the ground, um, the project not being able to pay off their primary financing, let alone their their bridge financing to us, all of those sort of things um, increases. And so at what point does a project get to, like at the point that the project has gotten to where we have to actually file legal action, does that just mean, I guess the question is we still want the units, right? So is there a piece of that that could mean that the city is able to take over management of the project and still deliver the units through uh, mm -hmm. ourselves or like, what does, how does that mean? I understand that we're just like a small piece of a much bigger financing package. So I'm yeah. not sure who else would also have the ability to take legal action and how that all gets sorted out. And maybe it just gets caught up in red tape, but I think the goal <laughs> is as we're, as we're, investing in these these projects that, that are harder to produce right like a deep permanent supportive housing is harder to produce there's just more moving pieces um if it ends up not working then what can we get how can we can yes. we step in and and as the city pick up the pieces and and still deliver the units let me see if I can break those down into different pieces to help answer. Um, I think first and foremost for this loan, from an RDA standpoint, as you said, we're, we're a very small piece of what is a larger project. We're a we're million dollars of what is a 16 plus million dollar loan. Um, the way we are currently structuring our involvement from the RDA side is we will be one of the last pieces of funding to come into this project. So by, as I said, those other conditions of being able to verify the status of the project and all of the funding sources and the construction progress before we as an RDA put a dollar into this project, we should be able to have a really good sense of where the project is. Is he tracking towards completion? And does the developer obviously have the funds necessarily to complete the project? And that, that will be just what we do as part of our job in terms of underwriting and dispersing funds and trying to make sure we're doing that in the least risky process uh, possible. So we will do that. We're in a good position in this project because we're coming in so late. We'll know, hopefully, uh, if, if there's any significant issues with the project at that point. And that in and of itself provides us a lot of protection of making sure we're good before our money goes out the door. Um, beyond that, and with other projects, typically what you're looking at is what is your lien position? Um, we generally, as an agency, are, are either second or third as far as a title position against the property, and we're usually behind a much larger uh, primary funding piece. And so that in and of itself is risky because you could be $2 million into a $50 million project. And what that does is that gets you a seat at the table, but you are waiting to see what the primary lender is going to do as far as uh, where the developer is in default. So um, we the generally, um, sorry. I the want primary to lender this. in this case is a private bank? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and again, tax credit deals are a little bit less risky because there's a, a usually a much larger equity source coming from the tax credit. So while they still have a primary lender and we come as secondary, a um, little bit less risk as far as um, the project because they're not borrowing as much, um, but there's still risk. And, and so in that case, you're looking at what your lien position is on a property to see what your recourse could be. And you're generally waiting to see what the primary lender is doing or whether they're going to put the borrower in default, whether they're going to foreclose or what they're going to do. Um, generally speaking, as an agency, we try to, beyond just being a, a, a lien holder on the property and somewhere on title, we do try to force our way into conversations and a seat at the table if a developer goes into default. And sometimes you'll see us ask for either a right to repurchase or you know first option. We're not always able to get those because those are uh, typically a comfort level for the primary lender. Um, but as you mentioned, Director Mono, that would be the process for us to then try to step in and see if we could either buy it back, take over the project, or whatever our involvement could be. 
In this case, if his primary lender is at $15 million and we're at $1 million, before we could do that and talk about buying it back or taking over management, we would have to negotiate or buy out that primary lender. So you would have to be able to clear that first priority lien and loan against the property if we then wanted to step in and really take over the project management or ownership. Um, and then furthermore, this project's a little bit tricky, as we know, because it's a ground lease. Um, so when we're talking about buying anything, what you're really talking about is buying the improvements on the property and you would then still be subject to the ground lease, but you would be stepping into the role of the developer or borrower in terms of ongoing ownership of the improvements or management or finishing the project. I think it's still an option that I would like us to retain. Um, not that it will be easy or ideal, but I think that's an option that is interesting for me to retain as far as remedies and, and recourse, um, right? And I guess I don't want to speak for anybody, but I think many of the concerns here are remedies and relates to remedy and recourse but i think this is uh an interesting conversation relates to any loans that uh that the rda is is uh, funding i think that this might help us improve on uh, remedies and recourse across the board uh and to make the system a little better uh for for what we want to accomplish here our tax dollars for housing are not many uh, and we want to make sure that the, the, we get the biggest impact uh, the fastest possible. Uh, so I think we, we are learning a lot through all of this and, and improving the system in general. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, board member Mano, please don't keep him in. I, I will wait if anyone else has questions first. Um, so my understanding is that's like a first right of refusal or it may actually be like a second or third right of refusal if the primary lender also has that in their contract. Is that kind of how that works? Yes, and, and that would just be, again, we don't necessarily anticipate that as part of our deal now, so that is something we would have to add and, and obviously look to see how that could fit within the larger structure of the project, but yes. I think what I'm hearing from uh, Board Chair Pui and uh, what I think others of us, I, I agree with, is that if uh, we'd like to consider having that added in and maybe just kind of always added in because I, I think we are, we may be the second or third in line in terms of the do amount of dollars we're lending, but we may be the first in line in terms of commitment to our community and to the residents that live around those projects. And so we may be willing to do something that the primary bank would not do. Um, and so I think it's a good idea for us as an RDA board or as an RDA to, to have that in as many of our contracts as possible, just so that we're preserving the option that we may do something and we may be willing to take over a project that a bank wouldn't be willing to take over, even if we have to buy out that primary lender uh, through the obligation. And, and it, even if it may be a big problem, it's it, it may be better for us to do that, to have the option to do that than to let the thing sit in, like foreclose and sit boarded up for many, many years. So I, I would like us to, to look at that. I agree. I agree. Any I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, just about this specific amendment, can you just remind me why? I know we had the original loan and then we amended it and then we rescinded the amendment and now we're looking at reinstituting the amendment with these additional terms. Why did we have to do an amendment in the first place? And what happens if we just say no? Does the loan just not go through or does the loan go through on the original terms? Like, wh why are we here again? <laughs> In the first place. <laughs> uh, great question. Um, with regard to why we as staff originally came back and asked for the amendment from the original approval, the reason for that is, as you know, uh, this loan was approved initially as part of the NOFA. As a function of that approval, we give a conditional funding request or approval or commitment, I should say, funding commitment. And then we as staff continue to look at the project, get updated information, uh, do our standard underwriting, review the pro forma, all of that. And then that is where we really start to apply, you know, looking at it, where is the need, where are the gaps? And so the, the easiest way to explain is, is we were doing that underwriting process. This project came in and, and while it needs funding for the project, that need was more in terms of the construction lending and, and filling that gap of the initial financing sources to do the project. And once the project was complete, 
and he was generating income and had a pro forma, there wasn't as much of a long-term gap in what his ongoing operating uh, needs would be. Um, again, that's a little bit different than what you see from tax credit deals because they're really you know tight on, on their entire budget, specifically their ongoing operating. Where this project where he you know, is, is operating it and leasing it at a certain rate and then has the vouchers to help offset that, there wasn't as much of a gap from that future, you know, next 30 years plus of operating as much as he needed to fill that construction budget. So that's why we proposed as an amendment that our true need and our true gap for this project is just getting that rehabilitation started. And once he can stabilize, he can take out his construction financing with a longer term financing pro uh, product. And then he should be able to take us out. And then he's fine from a pro forma standpoint long term. It was the construction need. So that's why we came back and said, let us restructure our loan so that we're in the construction period. We're out in three years when he refinances it. And then he's fine. Um, so that got us to July when we asked the board to approve that. Last week, as part of the action to rescind it, that was essentially to reconsider the action of approving that amendment. But that reconsideration also includes this discussion now of given the status of the project, uh, are there other things that maybe we should put as part of that approval when it comes back to you that address these other concerns that you have as a board? Okay, so if I could repeat that just so I know that I'm clear. The original loan was for a longer term. And 40 years. 40 years. And now we decided, okay, it actually makes sense or the project, we realized that for this project, it makes more sense for us to be a short term lender and get our money back quicker. And so that was what we changed it to. Then we rescinded that. And now we're thinking of still changing to that shorter term, but adding these additional terms based on additional information that we have, um, have gathered. So Correct. If we were to not do that, he could still get the loan that we originally approved. It would just be a 40 year term instead of a three year term. And I assume that has some sort of prepayment option within it. So yes. Us saying no means we don't get any of these additional terms that you just, that we just listed, but the loan still goes out. Yes. Just under a 40 year term, not a three. Yeah, you would you would defer back to that original funding commitment, um, and then as a board would have indicated that you're not interested in doing the amendment for the short term loan, and so we would then be looking to underwrite the loan under that original commitment and what the program and approval provides. Okay, and we expect that that it would still go that they would that the developer would still ask for that loan to be closed. <laughs> We would anticipate that they would still ask to be closed. I, I will say also as staff that there's, you know, as, as we said, one of the big parts of our loan approvals is a gap. And so there's a chance that, you know, as part of underwriting that longer term loan, um, we would be looking at where that gap really is then again, uh, and if it exists. Understood. Thanks, Danny. That's my, that's all my questions. Are you sure? apologize but thank you that like I, I it was it's so confusing and i think i'm barely grasping it but thank you for letting me no 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 this this has been useful for all of us so thank you for that any any other ones okay i think that, that answers many of our questions right now at the moment danny um do we need to discuss uh item c2 clarification on housing development uh loan program um, if there are questions from the board, uh, Mr. Chair, we're, we're absolutely happy to answer them. This is not a time sensitive issue for us. And so uh, if it pleases the board, we can certainly return to a later meeting and ask for reconsideration of that and, and provide more information. There's no urgency from us on, on that right now. Yeah. Danny, um, would it be appropriate since this uh, since this since this aspect relates to the overall loan program? Uh, some of the things that the council wants to add for all loans, would it be appropriate for the council to ask you, your uh, department to or division to um, department? <laughs> sorry, uh, come back with some of those as additions to that document or or to another official RDA document? Yes, uh, Cindy, to your point, specific to this, um, 
we could handle that as part of the NOFA. And when loans get approved in the NOFA and come back, we would add this language regarding the tax credits. Um, to your point, if there are other uh, items that the board would like us to, to add, uh, for instance, the one earlier about the right to repurchase, that's something we could just start incorporating into our standard loan documents. But if there's something of a larger policy issue, then yes, we can certainly come back and have that discussion along with all of these other items at the same time. Okay, and I was just thinking that it might be nice to have some of these things documented. I know that you will incorporate them into your loan terms, but long term, it might be nice to have it reflected that it's at the request of the um, board. So I don't know how you manage that internally, but just a just a thought. Thanks. No, I think that's a great thought, and we can we can uh, check back with the attorneys to see what's the appropriate mechanism to do exactly that and, and bring that back. Mr. Chair, policy dis discussion that, or policy point that we probably need to consider, and I don't think we can get to that today, but is uh, to the extent that we're going to be involved in projects that don't have LIHTC credits and thereby do not have a private bank and the federal government doing these sort of checks that we want the projects to have, and we're going to bring that in-house, what's the budgetary cost on that? Like, what, what, how many staff members do, does your department need? How much does that cost, and do we say that if there's not if it if these if these processes aren't happening externally then we need we can't reduce our interest rate as much or we can't whatever there's like a higher closing cost or something to recuperate some of those costs or help us pay for that um i'm not saying that we have to recuperate those costs but i want to know how much they are so that we can decide whether or not we should okay i think this uh if there's no more questions uh, we are not going to recess the, uh, the redevelopment agency board meeting, uh, and we might reconvene later into a closed session. Um, council Chair, when do you want us to reconvene us for council? How long do you need, Cindy Lou? Five minutes? Okay. Let's, thank you. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, thank you.